Good evening. So I'm delighted to welcome you all here this evening to In Conversation Live with me. I'm Gillian Lang, and I'm the Dean at the RSM, and Professor John Appleby. So welcome. Thank you. And before we start, I have all the details here about emergencies, and I don't think I need to read it all out other than to say we aren't expecting a fire drill. So if the alarm goes off, we have to leave. I think that's probably sufficient. So, John, you're, you're, you've, you're one of the country's foremost health economists, and you've been involved in many, many areas of policy making over the years. You've been advisor to the UK government and parliament in a variety of capacities. So we're going to have plenty to talk about and an opportunity for you as the audience to ask questions as well. There are microphones somewhere, but... Uh, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand, because it might be good to do that as we go along, if there's something you particularly want to ask about, relevant to what we've been discussing, rather than leaving it all to the end. Um, but I don't want to launch straight into economics. Good. Let's try and get <laughs> to know you first. So let's start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. What sort of childhood did you have? What did you want to be when you grew up? And tell me about dolly mixtures. Dolly mixtures. <laughs> <laughs> That's really thrown me. <laughs> Sorry, well, forget the dolly mixtures. Well, no, yeah. <laughs> so what sort of childhood? Um, so I grew up in, well, I was born in Wolverhampton. Um, my dad was an architect. Uh, my mum was an artist. So naturally, I went into economics. <laughs> yeah, but, um, uh, we moved down to London when I was about two and a half. My dad actually practised near here in Welbeck Street mm. uh, for a private um, architectural practice. Um, and then grew up in Teddington, south of London. We moved to a... They were known as Span Estates. So there were these sort of flat-roofed, modern, uh -huh. fairly trendy at the time, houses. Uh -huh. um, and yes, grew up there, went to school there as well. Um, and the dolly mixtures, uh, I read, you see, perhaps this was made up, but I did I read that you wanted to win story. the dolly mixture. You wanted to win the dolly mixture when you were aged five, it says on the internet. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> on the internet. Was that on the Wikipedia page? Yeah. Actually, <laughs> no, I discovered I have a Wikipedia page. I've got nothing to do with it. It's yeah, no, not it's not on Wikipedia. And, it's not but I discovered. <laughs> Once one of my sons edited the, the page and it read something like uh, blah, 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 John Appleby, one of whose sons is a leading striker for Arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, the Dolly mixture, yes, I, I think that refers to where I was at primary school, Stanley yeah. Road yeah. in Teddington, and um, one of the teachers had one of those confectioner's jars of Dolly mixtures. And um, she would give one to somebody who'd done something good in class. Just one. Just one. I know. Uh, but, I mean, the, the, the kids, you know, all our faces lusting after these dolls, just to have one, you know. <laughs> then, you know, that was, my yeah. kids don't believe this now, but, you know, just to have one dolly mixture was, you know, we were lucky. So, yeah, I never got one, um, <laughs> which is a shame. But, yeah. So, so w w when you were at school, moving out of primary school into secondary school, what, what were your ambitions? <laughs> Did you think you were going to be a health economist? Uh, no, no. <laughs> I don't think... It's one of those things, isn't it, about... There are, there are kids now who are going to get jobs which don't actually exist yet. Mm. And it wasn't a job... I didn't know what an economist was, let alone a health economist, and they weren't essentially weren't invented, so I didn't really have, have a distinct lack of planning in my life, I think, and I certainly didn't have some sort of, especially at that age, five-year career plan map marked out till I was to, re to retirement. Um, I did end up doing physics, maths, and economics A-level, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, and didn't do brilliantly in my A-levels, and I can blame other people, like teachers, but I, <laughs> I have to accept some responsibility <laughs> for that. I mean, I, was, I ended up being, I was the first person in my family to go to university. Mm -hmm. So my dad and my mum met at Birmingham Art and Architecture School. My dad in the architect, mm -hmm. architecture bit, my mum in the art school. But they went, they went there when they were 16. 
mm. and um, did, their, did their training. But they, they, there wasn't a university as such. Yeah. So your A-levels couldn't have been so bad that you didn't make it to university? No, but it was through... Uh, they, I didn't get the grades that I'd been offered. And uh, I went back. To, I remember going back to school saying, "Oh God, it's." I mean, it was a real blow I, I, mm. uh, when that happened. And I went back to school and said, "Oh, I think I need to retake them, mm. or some of them." Mm. And the teacher said, "No, of course not. You'll, you know, there are plenty of places. Just apply through clearing, which I did." And so, mm. yeah. And the, uh, the internet wasn't that helpful at mapping out all of your career, but at some point you worked for the NHS in Birmingham. <laughs> the father of a famous Arsenal striker. I'm, I'm surprised you didn't bring that one up. Um, sorry, it's said again. You, I went to... <laughs> After university, um, you, you, you at some point then ended up working for the NHS in Birmingham. Is that right? Yeah. So this is... Um, so when would this be? So... Um, I went to, my first degree was in economics, and then I yeah. did a master's in health economics yeah. at York, which was, then it had been going for about four or five years, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. and it was essentially Alan Maynard, Tony Cullier, who you know well, um, Alan Williams were the three economists who basically put together a course, and then subsequently I worked in universities, and I realised from the other end how this works, which is, we've got these modules, we could put them together and make a master's out of it, you know, <laughs> flog that to students. It wasn't quite like that, but it was essentially an, an MSc in, uh, in economics, but with some healthcare mm -hmm. stuff, in a sense, mm -hmm. bolted on. Mm -hmm. So I did that, and there were about six UK students then who did it, yeah. six overseas students. Mm -hmm. um, I remember all the overseas students were failed on this master's, mm -hmm. and it was clearly an issue around English and written English. Uh, in fact, we, you know, the, the British students did lead a little protest to Alan Williams and Alan Maynard about this, because it just seemed, you know, they were absolutely devastated. You know, there are quite a few of them sponsored by governments as well, uh, and they failed. Anyway, so after that, I, I applied for a job uh, working on a Department of Health project, and it was based in South Birmingham Health Authority, as they were then called. And that was essentially to um, see how we could collect activity data from district nurses. So one of my, so how much, you know, how much time do they spend in clinics doing this, that and the other, and then could we cost it and produce mm. a sort of satellite account of how the authority's money was mm. being spent. Mm. And there were some other parallel projects in hospital as well. And blow me if about 40 years later, we're just about getting there. I, I so, was going to say, do we have that data Well, now? almost, <laughs> almost. We've had um, something called the national reference costs, which are hospital-based, so something like, what, 1,500, 2,000 uh, healthcare resource groups, and every hospital has to collect this, and they have to cost them out. So we, know, we now know, well, we've known for some time now, how much a hip operation costs. But when I started in the health service, we knew how much we spent on nurses or s syringes or drugs. Mm. But if you, somebody asked the obvious question, well, how much do you spend on uh, mental health? Or how much do we spend on mm. knee operations? We, nobody knew. Mm. Mm. And without that information, you, know, you couldn't really make decisions about, well, the whole set of decisions about how you allocate money and so on. Anyway, the project I was involved in was working with district nurses, which was really fascinating. Mm. And I had to redesign their diaries uh, so they collected information. And it did teach me one big thing about how do you get data from people um, and how do you make it worth their while? Because we were asking them to tick boxes and do times and various things. And it's a lot of work, you know. They've got other better healthcare things to do. And so we hit on the idea of feeding back to the nurse teams their activity. Yeah. And we'd chart it for them, and so um, we produce these charts. And, and it's quite interesting how competitive the dif different district nursing teams in South Birmingham became. You know, like, well, our chart's going up here. You know, we're doing more work than you, and so on. Um, but it was a way of it feeding back the data that people were actually collecting, feeding that back, and making them realise it is actually real stuff, and so on. I mean, it's, it's effectively an audit, isn't it, that probably drove... It was also, yeah, that was right, yeah, that yeah. was also a good audit, and <laughs> it, it did actually throw up 
some anomalies where we thought there was one team who were obviously completing their diaries in a slightly different way, and it, mm. so that helped with that as well. And the only other thing with, with South Birmingham, then there weren't chief execs, there were district administrators, mm. which tells you everything you need to know about how the NHS was run. It was a sort of, we are the administrators here, we're not, mm. in a sense, managers. So I don't know why I did that, air quotes. <laughs> You know what I mean? They're not managers, they were administering a system. Mm. The money flowed down, the budget was set for health, the health authority, they spent it on their hospitals, which were old Victorian workhouses mm. in South Birmingham with walls sort of this thick. Mm. Um, actually, one of the jobs that, that I had when uh, working with district nurses was looking at some of the supplies they had. So one of the, the big things was uh, incontinence pads, which would, they would distribute to people in their homes. Mm -hmm. And um, one day I went down to see, there were two women who ran the sort of supplies department for the community. So walking frames, walking sticks, inco pads and so on. And I, was, I just got talking to them about what they did and so on and how they worked. And they said, oh yeah, yeah, we're going to be running out of inco pads soon. Uh, but we always do, just before the end of the month. So I asked why, I said, well, we don't, we don't have enough. And the district nurses have to use, they use newspaper. <laughs> they tear up newspaper and they shove that down the pants of old people in South Birmingham for a few days. I was just thinking, what? We, you know, this is the NHS. Anyway, it led to, well, why can't we just order some more? And they said, well, we're not in charge of the budget. You know, we, you know nobody listens to us. Um, so together with a colleague from this team I was working with, with district nurses, we... We did work out from some studies how many inco pads the residents of South Birmingham needed. Mm. And it wasn't much more than they were being ordered. And we never worked out how much it cost. It was a pathetic amount of money. I can't remember offhand, something like 5,000 quid extra a year. Mm. Mm. And we, we showed that to the district administrator who said, well, that's ridiculous. Let's just pay them. Mm. I think that's my big, biggest success, if you're ever going to ask me that question, was making sure that old people in South Birmingham, you know, didn't have the indignity of, yeah. you know, of that. Yeah. Goodness. So h how did you get from, from that and the Inco pads to the King's Fund and being its chief economist? Oof. Well, um, <laughs> well, February the 1st, and then I won't go day by day. No, no, no. <laughs> so, so I worked in South Birmingham on this Department of Health project, which uh, had a limited time. But for some reason, there was a deal with the authority that I would become permanent there. Mm. And I thought, well, that's OK. Uh, but then the district administrator said, well, can you write a job description for a district health economist? Hmm. And there weren't, no. there was, I think, yeah. maybe one other health economist working in the yeah. NHS yeah. in London. Yeah. Um, so I, I sweated away, wrote a job description. I sent it to Alan Williams, actually, mm -hmm. and said, you know, is this, what do you think? You know, I th I'm not quite sure what I'm meant to be doing here. Um, <laughs> And he said, well, if you can do all that, then the NHS has no problem. But he doubted I could do all the things I'd set out in this job description. Yeah, but um, there weren't many health economists, were there, at that point? I I'm, I'm think NICE was set up in 1999, and in the early days, Mike Rawlins would say, we're employing, we're using all the health economists in the country. <laughs> <laughs> he might have been over. Yeah, no, then, then there really wasn't. This is, this is sort of early 1981, yeah. too. Um, so I did that for a... a a, a few years. Then I worked for, again in Birmingham, um, it was called the National Association of Health Authorities, mm -hmm. NAHA, um, which is the forerunner of the NHS Confederation, which was essentially is a sort of a management organisation for the NHS. Mm -hmm. and in fact, the origins of NAHA it was run by Philip Hunt, mm -hmm. Lord Hunt mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, and it was actually an idea of Barbara Castle's. So Barbara Castle, Labour Health Minister, was keen to have some organisation out of the Department of Health, in a sense arguing the case for the NHS, for more money, for, for this, that and the other, which would help her in her negotiations with the Treasury. So little changes over time. But So now, that was the origins of NAHA, and I managed the research there. Then was offered a job by, in fact, Chris Hamm, who became yeah, a chief yeah, exec yeah. at the King's Fund at the University of Birmingham. Um, and then I was uh, asked to help set up a department at the University of East Anglia. 
and it was meant to be, so UEA, University of East Anglia, had done some research and they'd, they'd what's the next, what, what's the area we should get into much more and healthcare came top of the list. Mm. So they wanted to set up, they've now got a medical school as well, they, now, they set up a department, they wanted to set up a department which was, we looked a bit like the Bass Street kids, you know, the short one was the epidemiologist, the tall one was the health economist and so on. So a, a group of healthcare people, researchers, and so I went there for three or four years. Um, and then uh, I had a call from um, a guy called Nick Mays, you may have, mm -hmm. Professor Nick Mays is at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine now, but then he worked at the King's Fund and he said, uh, there's a job coming up. And I, and I said, whose job's that? He said, my job, I'm leaving, and you should apply for it. So I did, and then moved down to London. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in fact, the job was called, what was it called? Um, Director of Health Systems, or something like that. Nobody knew what it was or what it meant. And I didn't really know either, but there was, King's Fund then was set up in teams, so there was a primary care team, health systems team, and acute team, and, and so on. And so I was running that, that group then. Um, in fact, the chief economist <laughs> uh, role, or name rather, not role, but name, came up because I was interviewed on a Panorama program by a great journalist called John Ware. And I can't remember what the, what the thing was, but um, they all obviously need a title. And he said, what should we call you? And I said, well, I'm the director of health systems. And he just looked at me and said, nobody's going to know what that means. You know, <laughs> can we call you, I don't know, can we just call you chief economist? And I thought, yeah, all right, yeah, go on. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so that appeared on the strap line. So I was interviewed, and it's John Appleby, chief economist at the King's Fund much to the surprise of Julian Neuberger, who was the chief exec of the King's Fund, who saw it and said, did, did we change the name of your job? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, it, well, you know, it just seemed easier, and I'm, you know, I don't think any harm's done. And uh, she said, shall we stick with that? And in fact, chief economist, has, uh, that role has a very specific role in, in, in banking, in businesses, and so on. It's a, it is a speaking truth to power type role. Mm -hmm. And... It's a bit like a, a sort of company secretary in some ways in that, in that yeah. role. Yeah. Um, and in fact, it's sort of taken off a bit more. I think Oxfam have a chief economist now. Um, mm. And that, that sort of, that use of that name. But it, it is a sort of, to one side of the, the board, as it were, or, or the group, and being able to say, no, it's like this, really. Mm. Not sure I ever did that particularly at the King's Fund. But, yeah. yeah. Anybody want to ask any questions? Yeah, I thought I'd seen a hand at the back. D um, there is a microphone. I don't know how loud your voice is. You can give it a go. No, it's just you, you touched on getting the data from district nurses and that. Um, I was just wondering, is the... Do you, is, is, it on? <laughs> is there any um, barriers that are still... Because, I mean, economic data is quite stark and quite dry. <coughs> do you, well, I mean, it depends, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, to most people. Yeah, yeah. But do, do you see any, um, do you still see the same barriers that you had back then, or are there new barriers to collecting the data? And if there are, what sort of things could you do, or could anyone do, to sort of overcome them? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, I think there's still the, potential barriers of when you're asking people, busy people, often clinicians, um, healthcare professionals, patients, you know, oh, do you mind just filling in this form? You know, oh, well, bloody hell, you know, it's difficult enough doing my job, let alone having to fill in a, you know, a damn form about what I've been doing or whatever. Um, so that's still an issue, and I think, and it's hard to, you know, how do you get around it? Well, one way is what we did with the district nurses, which is, how can we make that information that you're collecting useful to you as well, directly? So you say, yeah, I, I tick a box here, it comes through the system, and then at the end of the week or the month, I, I, get, I, don't know, I get a report or some comparative stuff or something useful, you know. So I think that's, whenever the NHS is setting up new ways of gathering data, they have to, I think you should always consider how you close that loop. 
And as you were saying, Jill, this also be, provides a sort of audit of the quality of the data. So well, actually, one of the things, I mentioned the national reference costs. I mean, there are some big issues there about how good, how good they are. I mean, I, I actually, I suspect it's a junior accountant in hospitals who've been tasked with doing this because the data is not always that useful to the trust itself. And so there's an issue about the quality of the data. So what you need to do is f feed it back in some way. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there's that. I mean, I think there are new, newer things, actually. I certainly don't remember any issues around data privacy coming up early on in the NHS when I was... Uh, in fact, and, I mean, it's really... I remember sitting at the King's Fund, actually, and then this is... I'll say last century, because that sounds like a long time ago, but it wasn't that long ago. And I had a, a CD-ROM on my desk with 15 million patient records on. And it was just lying against my computer. Um, and that was not, you know, I, it wasn't locked in a safe, or whatever. It was actually anonymized data and so on, so it would have been quite difficult. And it was encrypted, but so it would have been quite difficult to get it. But it wasn't... You know, in a sense, I'm ashamed to say the attitude then was, it, you know, that's the data, I need it, you know, and we weren't really thinking of privacy issues. So I think that's a really big issue at the moment. Mm. And if you go back a bit further in, in the last century when everything was still on paper, I think that privacy around that data, be it in the hospital or be it in primary care, was, was pretty rudimentary. But as it's become more and more digitised, we worry more and more about it. I suppose you can splurge masses of data out quite easily, can't you? That's why. But, you know, in the yeah, past... I think there are also... I mean, I, I was part of a group with the Department of Health and NHS Digital uh, involved in care.data, if people remember that, which was, mm -hmm. in a sense, an attempt to... Uh, get uh, primary care data from general practice in a similar way that we had hospital data, hospital episode statistics, which are built up from individual patient records. So we know how people, how long people stay in hospital, what was done to them, where they came from. We can work out waiting times. As a, a, I mean, it's been a huge, huge benefit. Um, but not many people really knew about it. And it, and, it, and it started in the 1990s, and it's rolled on, and it's got better, and so on. Mm. Care.data came along, and there were some um, data privacy groups who really objected to this. And it was partly on privacy grounds. How can you guarantee that somebody won't jigsaw some data together and work out Mrs. Bobbins over there, you know, is, you know, what happened to her, and so on. What about insurance companies if they get their hands on the data? Um, what about um, uh, slightly evil data, private sector data firms, and what will they do with it, and so on? So there were, it, all those issues came up, which I, was a new thing. Uh, and in the end, care.data didn't really happen, although it's actually sort of happening anyway now, to be honest. So, um, so there are, yeah, I think there are some different issues and some similar issues, really. Yeah, Karen. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you about reference costs again. Yeah. Um, so uh, I've, I'm, I'm doing a, finishing up a study right now looking at what are the, doing a micro-costing study down in a big teaching hospital <coughs> on the south coast. So we're looking at what's the difference between doing um, open surgery um, for arterial bypass or doing an endovascular procedure in a day clinic. So we would go on and we've watched what everyone's doing and we've interviewed them and asked and, and tried to put together a pretty good map of who does what and when they do it and what all this costs. And once we've done that, we thought, well, as a sanity check on our cost calculations, let's go and look at the NHS reference costs. And sometimes... I can see what's coming here. Yeah. They were kind of <laughs> there, but a lot of the time they were far off. Yeah. But uh, the question really, though, is... is when we compared the NHS reference costs for these procedures with what hospitals are actually being paid uh, under the NHS tariff, what we found was a lot of the time the tariff payments are considerably less than those reference costs. Um, I suppose the question is, do, can we trust these reference costs? <laughs> uh, and, and if we can't, what is the point of hassling hospital staff who've got lots of other things to be doing to be collecting all of this? 
Well, well, just on the collection, the, as I understand, the reference costs are all done in this sort of finance department. So um, there's nothing in terms, so you're asking, you know, finance people to do that. And in aggregate, they have to add up to the bottom line for the, the trust. So it will, if you just look at two figures, you multiply the reference costs against the activity, that should add up to how much the, the accounts actually say the trust spent that year. So that's, that, that has to happen. Um, but the activity is counted anyway, um, and that classification of HRGs goes into the computer system anyway. What has to happen is some accountant has to make decisions about how you allocate cost to each of the HRGs. And there are big chunks of overheads, so, you know, heating and lighting. How much of that is, should go to hips? How much should go to knees? Um, some of the staff costs are sort of linked directly to things, although not that directly. So all the nursing costs, they, well, what chunk of that should go to hips and knees and so on. And quite a lot of it is actually allocated in terms of length of stay. So how long is somebody staying in hospital? We know a daily cost, because we've got that from, you know, with the accounts. As it were, and so that will determine a lot of it. So it is a bit rough and ready. Yeah. I mean, there are... Um, hospitals are moving to an even more detailed, what's it called, PLICS, patient level information costing system, is that, I think, is what it refers to. Um, I'm not completely okay with how that works, but it's meant to be more detailed and so on and more accurate. But again, what's the incentive for, for hospitals and trusts to get these numbers right? I mean, one incentive, you mentioned the, the payments that, that hospitals get. Um, and they don't often match the actual cost. Well, that's on purpose. So payment by results, which has sort of been, fa not faded away, but uh, policy decisions are that hospitals don't get paid for the activity they do. It's more, the contracts have changed now. But uh, payment by results is based on an average cost for, say, a hip operation across the whole country. So at least half the hospitals are going to be, their costs are going to be lower than that, and some half are going to be higher than that, roughly. Um, and that was meant to act as an incentive for those with higher costs to do something about their costs. And on top of that, how do you, in a public service, encourage greater efficiency, apart from having that sort of payment system, which has an average cost? Uh, well, the way that the um, Department of Health uh, do it, and NHS England do it, is... Um, we take the money away and ask questions later. So, in fact, the tariff is set deliberately less than that average anyway. So, and that becomes, so it's two or three percent each year. So that becomes the efficiency saving, which they can then present to the Treasury, presume, and say, well, this is what we're doing, you know. And it's then up to the trust to actually, you know, in a sense, cope. <laughs> So this is the money coming in, and this is the activity you're going to do. Well, actually, the whole payment by results thing was first mooted, going back to sort of 2005 or something, 2003. Um, I and a few colleagues at the King's Fund, uh, using the national reference costs, try to work out what hospitals' marginal sort of uh, revenue could be. So if you are a typical hospital, where should you... Or if you are UCLH, or if you are... Uh, the Whittington or whatever, and this is your uh, range of work you do, and these are the reference costs for all that work, which things should you stop doing right. or do less of? Which things should you perhaps focus on <laughs> because you're bringing in the money? Mm. And, you know, I, I don't know that Trust did this, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I would be, in a sense, I'd hope they didn't, but they, that could have been one of the upshots of doing this, is mm. that, hey, ophthalmology is doing well. It's really it's bringing in millions. Orthopedics. Orthopedics right. doing well. Let's uh, let's let's all do that. In fact, I did meet a, a, an ophthalmologist some years ago who he really got into the whole reference cost thing, and he did actually work out he knew what his budget was, and then he started looking at the reference costs and their activity, and he realised that they were bringing in something like five or ten million more than the costs, and he armed with this information, he went to the chief exec and said. Uh, can I have some more nurses now? <laughs> and plus another couple of consultant posts, because look, we're earning all this money for you. So I don't know those, but those sort of things may have happened. But it's, again, it's, it's absolutely vital data, but how do, we, how do we get it from people and how do we ensure it's accurate? 
And that work you were talking about costing, costing the, the NHS, if you like, was that part of the Wanless review? Because <coughs> he, wasn't he asked by Gordon Brown to look at how much funding the NHS needed? And I think you were involved in that. Yeah, I wasn't. <laughs> yes, I wasn't involved in the original work that Derek Wanless did for Gordon Brown. So people may remember that um, in 2000, Tony Blair was interviewed by David Frost on the um, Breakfast with Frost programme. And Blair announced on that programme, I've been actually been, I've been writing something about this recently, looking at the actual transcript of the programme. And David Frost's opening questions were basically, uh, why aren't you spending more money on the NHS? And at the time, there were, do people remember Mavis Skeet? She was, I think she died of cancer and she'd had her operation postponed and various things and her daughter campaigned on her behalf. And I think Blair had been confronted by her daughter about all this. Anyway, there was a lot going on in the news about this and Blair announced that the Labour government would spend a lot more on the NHS. And in fact, that did turn out to be the case. They spent something like two to two and a half percent of GDP more on the NHS over the years. Um, they committed to get us up to the European average, the, I think, didn't they? Yeah, so called European average. Mm. And essentially they did. Um, but um, Blair announcing this, apparently, I mean, how apocryphal some of this is, I don't know, but he'd forgotten to tell Gordon Brown, who was the Chancellor, <laughs> or omitted to tell Gordon Brown. <laughs> Um, and apparently after the programme, Gordon Brown um, said, you, you've stolen my fucking budget. And, <laughs> you know, I've got no more money. You know, this is it now. This is, um, and partly, I suppose, I never really found this out, but to get in on the act and to, to claw back something on this, Gordon Brown employed the ex-chief exec of NatWest Bank, Derek Wanless, to do a review, a sort of 20-year look into the future. How much do we need to spend? on healthcare, and conveniently the numbers would work out to match what Tony Blair <laughs> talked about, of course. And um, about five years, so that report came out in 2002, I think, and it recommended something like between 11 and 13% of GDP uh, on the NHS and private care by 2022, in fact, last year. Um, and a few years after that, Derek Wanders came to the King's Fund and wanted to work with me and some colleagues to actually look back and had that actually, had the money gone in, did, did the NHS buy all those scanners, employ all those people, had productivity gone up, uh, all the things that he had sort of said have to happen. Yeah. And broadly, yeah, the money went in, the scanners were bought, the hospitals were built, the, st the staff increased by 30% over five or six years, real big boost in staff. What hadn't really happened was on the sort of public side that people hadn't really started eating their greens and stopping smoking and stopped drinking and so on. And the productivity had perhaps not taken off the way that Wanless had he'd assumed it would. So, but one of the things working with Derek Wanless is that there was a chart, the one chart from his big report was these curves going into the future of how much spending there would be or should be. And they weren't straight lines just going on ad infinitum. They actually sort of bent over at some point uh, and flattened off. Mm. And I did ask Derek, why, how had he got that to happen? <laughs> how did, you know, because why is it just going on? And, what, and he just, he wouldn't say, but he said, but, but, but he did quote, and actually maybe just after this, maybe we could have yeah, the we'll slide. The slide actually. They did quote um, an American economist called Herb Stein, and Stein is famous, or famous, famous in, for economists, uh, for a law, Stein's law, which is essentially, it sounds a bit banal when you say it out loud, but in fact, it, there's something quite deep about it. If something can't go on forever, it will stop. So clearly, healthcare spending couldn't go on increasing faster than GDP forever. I mean, obviously, 100% would be a limit, but way before then, it would have to stop. So. He just said, oh, well, Stein's law. But it was a treasury thing as well. They, they weren't going to have this, in a sense, open-ended line. They wanted mm. some target into the future, and that would be it. Mm. And we sort of got there. Um, yeah. 
we must look at your slide because that bit about longer term financial sustainability is fairly topical at the moment, isn't it? You know, we, we, um, we've, some, of, well, some of us will have read a report recently by Richard Taunt who says the NHS won't make a hundred. I don't know if you've seen that, but then there I was have. the King's Fund seminar, I think it was 2012, which asked the question for the NHS is the next 50 years in the next 50 years, is the NHS going to be financially sustainable? So it's, it's a really important question to look at. How do we get your slide up? Well, just because yeah, yeah. I've got to think about the shout at the AV man. Shout but uh, AV just man. on the sustainability, that has always been a worry. It's yeah. not, it really isn't a recent thing. So a few years after the NHS opened its doors, the Treasury got very worried about how much was being spent on, on healthcare, mm. on the NHS. Mm. And they set up, and I can't remember the name of the committee now, anyway, they set up a House of Commons committee to look at this. Then they were spending about three or four percent of GDP on healthcare, and they were worried this was going to, you know, this was not sustainable. And in fact, some economists they employed on that committee said, well, the sky is not going to fall in and it will be okay, so don't worry. But that worry about sustainability crops up every five, ten years. Sorry, this chart yeah. is um, perhaps just to say something about, I hope you can see it. It's, you can see up the X, up the Y axis is percent of GDP, and this is, this is the US, but you could do a similar-ish sort of one for the UK. But it comes, at least the black line comes from, it's one of my favourite charts actually, it's um, Every few years, the, um, in, in the States, the Congressional Budget Office, which is a bit like our OBR, uh, but much, much bigger, and it examines government policy and it costs things out. Anyway, every few years it does a review of total healthcare spending in the US. And this chart, which I've redrawn, the black line, comes was actually an actual chart in their 2007 report. It's almost the last page of a very thick report, Appendix Z almost. And they put it in because they wanted to show what projecting US spending based on how much US spending was going up above GDP between 2000 and I think uh, 1970 and 2007. So if you take that projection and just carry on into the future, where's it going to go? Uh, well, this is where it's going to go. By 2080, 99% of the biggest economy in the world they'd spend on healthcare with 1% on everything else. And they said this probably, I think they used the word probably wasn't sustainable. <laughs> I think um, almost, Only the almost <laughs> certainly wasn't sustainable. Um, but a question, an economic question is at what point is it truly not sustainable? And in fact, as I plotted the blue line is what actually, what has actually happened, what we know up to now. And in fact, they have, the US has started to veer off that, that projection. But it's still growing, and it could be projected to... That, so you can see the COVID blip there, extra spending. So it could be maybe a third of, the, as I say, the biggest economy in the world spent on healthcare. Maybe. But I think, the, I mean, for me as an economist, the, it does raise a question, at what point does Stein's law really kick in? And we have to say, that is enough now. Mm -hmm. And there is an economic answer, in theory. <laughs> And what's, what's, is that easy? Do you want me to tell you yes. what the theory is? <laughs> and I'll come on to the practice. But uh, in theory, um, what you could plot is um, a line similar to that, but on the y-axis you have benefits from healthcare spending, however you might measure mm -hmm. them, qualies, mm -hmm. lives saved, whatever it might be. And you could even generalise that into just benefits of spending in, in very broad terms, whatever it's on. And you could have a line that if you're spending nothing, then you're getting nothing. So it starts at the origin. But it rapidly can go up. Mm. So you spend a little bit on healthcare and you get some, you know, immunisation and vaccination is a classic case. It doesn't cost much. You get huge uh, benefits from that. But as you go on spending, do we expect the line just to carry on in a straight line fashion? Probably not. What we almost certainly get is a diminishing marginal returns, i.e. the line starts to bend over, so every extra pound you spend gets you a bit more, but it doesn't get you quite as much as the last pound you spent. So the curve starts bending. And 
it could be that it actually starts to flatten off and then even go the other way, so that actually you're spending too much on it, and you're actually causing ill health by spending too much. Some of you might recognize that Ivan Illich thing, yes, about iatrogenic disease. Um, but the question an economist would ask, and this is why it's, it's, it's really crap to go shopping with an economist. Um, you know, if you see a, a nice suit in the window, so, wow, yes, but what the, what, as an economist, what you think is, well, what else could I spend my money on? Mm. I, is that suit worth it in holiday terms or whatever it may be? So everything has an opportunity cost that you're committing money when you could be getting benefits from spending on something else. And clearly with healthcare, healthcare is not the only thing we want. We want education, we want good roads, we want housing, we want a whole range of, we want coffee, we want iPhones, we want private spending. There's a whole range of different things we want out of uh, resources we have. So the question is, at what point do we trade off healthcare spending for something else, or something else for healthcare spending? So there is a notional point on the curve way before we get to 100% or 99% of GDP, where we're thinking, actually, we're losing out too much here. We're getting more health but we're losing on education or housing. So that's in theory, if we could plot all those in sort of investment curves for every conceivable type of spending, public and private, over time, we could work out a point where 20% of GDP is enough or 15% on healthcare, and then we want to flatten off and we'll swap to something else. I mean, you can see the practical problems with this. Um, and f measuring this sort of thing. But there is, in a sense, a theoretical answer and a way of thinking about it can't go on to 99%, but at what point has the curve has got to bend over at some point, and at what point should that be? Um, and we could, I think, work towards getting some grip on that, but I don't hold out too much hope on getting some real... It's, there's no real technical answer to that. Any questions from the audience? Um, yes, in the... In the Oh, you've got the, you've got the mic. <laughs> Come to you. Can I have it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've got it. Can I? Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, actually an uh, excellent introduction to my question. <laughs> Everything that you said, I, I wanted to ask you, but you did it perfectly. Uh, at, uh, you're talking about at what point, but it is your economist and, a, and speaking truth to the authority. Uh, you also have to say, what is the better buy? Because we are buying now services. I'm not interested in service. I mean, it's interesting to buy health as a, as a buyer, and that's a public. So how do you see uh, uh, now, uh, when are we going to start buying outcomes, which is health in particular, or less Ill illness? When are we going to move those investments I'm not asking you uh, exactly about the point on the diminishing uh, returns curve, but uh, like, what are the practical obstacles apart from legacy of the huge healthcare system that is based on, on curative medicine? So, sorry, just to throw it back at you, just to make sure I understood what you said. So, yeah, I don't care that we, I don't really want to buy doctors or drugs. I don't, I want to, just to keep them off the street, as it were. <laughs> Um, and what, I want, what I want is what they, in combination, in their joint enterprise with other people and, and resources, produce for health. And then also some of the other things that health then gives us, so ability to work and to enjoy our life, you know, a whole range of other things, which attributes of health care, if you like. Um, so that's... Is that your question? That where, where, what are we really investing in? Yeah, where the where healthcare stops? Because if you go upstream, I mean, you, you, as you, as you mentioned, there, there will be education that actually has sure. a really big impact on health sure. and, and, yeah, yeah. and longevity. So, yeah. where uh, you, as a health economist, stop thinking about when you go upstream? Well, it is a really tricky. It's quite a tricky issue, and in fact. A nice have somehow had to grapple with this. What's the boundary of your, what you're looking at? You know, the costs to whom? Just the health system, the health system and patients, patients and their carers, the whole economy. <laughs> you know, and so if you look at economic evaluations of inter healthcare interventions, it's 
they, you know, just to be just to be able to get out of bed in the morning to do the evaluation, you have to be quite strict about what the scope is, and it may be a, too narrow. Sorry, not I do that all the time. It may be too narrow. Uh, I absolutely agree, and it's a very it's a it's a, it's, it's very tricky, <laughs> but. Um, as I say, to be able to even make headway practically on some of these things, you've got to accept, maybe for the time being or forever, that you, you're never going to get to that perfect place where you're, in a sense, taking everything into account. So it's a bit analogous to what I was saying about, well, what's the ideal spending on healthcare? Well, there must be one, and we know it's less than all of GDP, um, but we just don't, you know, practically, how can you put your finger on where it is? Um, and I think there are, you know, there are attempts. So to, to economists do look at. You can present different scenarios. You can model it in different ways, and so on. Um, uh, but it's can we, can we uh, call education a healthcare? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things. And one of the things that I suppose economists do talk about is that um, goods and services have a lot of uh, outcomes. So education doesn't just have the outcome of uh, educated people, as it were, um, but is, is also um, daycare for parents. Uh, it is also has a health benefit, and so on. There's a whole range of things. And so uh, one of the things, it's a bit like hospitals have a range of attributes as well. It's not just that they produce health or health care, um, but they're near to a patient or not near. They have waiting lists. They have a whole a range of different things, which when you're thinking about investing in a hospital, what you, may, you have to consider all these things, really. But there, there are practical limits on some of this stuff. Yeah. I think we've got a couple more questions waiting. The gentleman in the back row first, and then we'll come um, to you. Thank you. For thank you. Great talk. Thank you very much. Um, an observation for you uh, on, on your chart. Um, the, the blue line is, is probably equivalent to the American spending deficit by the government. Um, which is funded half by the Chinese and 25% by the Saudis. <laughs> so as a, as a where it might actually stop growing, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a political element which is quite interesting um, as to how it all gets funded. Um, I, so that's a, as an observation. I'm a product of NHS parents. I've been in and out of the NHS all my life, economist, uh, accountant, and a member of, uh, of this uh, Royal Society. Um, and I've had discussions about funding NHS and how you go about efficiently reallocating resources. So my question to you is, um, you, you're being promoted now to being uh, chief executive of the hospital in, in Utopia. All right. <laughs> what's, your, what's, your dream, what's your dream hospital look like um, from the point of view of allocating resources and on the other side, accountability? Okay, have we got another? We've <laughs> <laughs> got to get that three minutes. Question, isn't it? <laughs> three minutes. Go. Um, all right. Let me just try and tackle that. I mean, uh, so I'm in charge of a hospital. Sorry, slight sidebar. One of my sons used to have a game called. And it was a video game, computer game called something like Hospital Manager. It wasn't, it wasn't called that, but it was something like that. And sorry, I, I will answer that question, but I'm just sorry. It's just set off this thing. It, it was basically the game was managing a hospital. And it was brilliant. It was rather sort of uh, Lego-ish figures in a sort of cutaway hospital. And the game was basically patients came in the door and they were treated and then you earned money, you know. And as you earned more money, you could build another clinic or whatever. And so the object of that game was to get big, build a bigger and bigger hospital. So that was the one outcome. Although along the way, it had very funny names for the diseases, like bloaty head. And the treatment was a doctor just stabbing these, these heads, which would make a sort of farting noise as they went down again. And in fact, there's, um, yeah, I have to, yeah, there's, there's something about all these names. But, and also MRSA would build up, and it would physically build up in the corridors as lumps of purple stuff. And then you had to employ, and if you got too much of that, the patients got ill and you lost customers on. So you had to then employ people in brown overalls with brooms to sweep up the MRSA, and they just sweep it out the front door or something. You know. So that, but that was just made me think: what are the setting the objectives, or in a sense, the contract with whoever's paying, is a, that's quite a big thing in economics. Is how do you do that? How do you how do you design a, a, a good contract, and what should the objectives be? 
So there's something, I suppose if I was in charge of a hospital, what I'd be trying to produce is health. So how do I, for, for my bucks, get the biggest bang in health terms? So one of the things I'd need to do is start measuring health. I'd actually have to start, so one of the things I did when I first started working at South Birmingham Health Authority as the <laughs> grandiose titled district health economist was filling in a form, collecting activity data. And one of the things I filled in was um, these activity and waiting times, SH3s. I don't know whether that's been lodged in my brain somewhere. That's what the form was called. And um, I'd fill in the, tick the activity. And the categories of patient activity were uh, dead and discharged, <laughs> and discharged dead. So that was essentially, is actually worse than Florence Nightingale's categorization of relieved, unrelieved, and dead, and so on. We had a worse category of outcome for the hospital. Um, and economists, actually, health economists, and Alan Maynard in particular, and others, were very big advocates of patient reported outcome measures. And so that would be, definitely have to be something we really measured in a, a comprehensive way throughout the, my hospital, as I'll call it. Um, and Otherwise, sort of, what's the point? Um, and we can, I think, asking patients, and the, I mean, it's been a big disappointment, I think. The NHS did get enthusiastic, and the NHS England Department of Health did get enthusiastic about prongs mm -hmm. quite a few years ago, and at one point ended up with three interventions, I think, hips, knees, and I uh, can't remember the other one. What we've, I think we're still collecting prongs data on hips and knees. And it is a before and after the intervention, and it's a form, and you tick various things about your health as you see it. Um, it's a vital, things like that are vital in terms of NICE's work. Uh, you can't construct qualities otherwise. You've got to know what the quality bit is. Um, and who better to know than that than the patient? Uh, so economists and other psychologists especially have put a lot of work into you know, designing the forms and valuing the, the, the outcomes and so on. So I think that would be, I think yeah. that would be the top line is, yeah, for the budget I had, maximising the, the health outcome with the resources I could purchase with that budget. I mean, but I, I suspect you'd probably rather not have that job even in New Tokyo. No. <laughs> <laughs> I should say I'm retired now, so I don't, I don't want that job. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Have you got the microphone? Yes, please carry on. Um, thank you. Uh, that graph is completely fascinating, and it seems to me clear that health could gobble up, you know, 100% of GDP. But somewhere we have to, you know, exercise some restraint. I feel that the general public ought to be educated to ask for less, if you like, because there seems to be an encouragement that we are entitled to this. We're entitled to all sorts of treatments, however futile or however um, you know, cancer treatment, for example, at the end of life, mm. the expense of cancer drugs, which might um, prolong life by about three months, should we not be more open and say quality of life isn't good and we can't afford this sort of thing? Um, end of life care, terribly expensive overall. Are we just prolonging things too much and just is the general public asking yeah. and some hospital consultants asking for too much. I think I think there is some evidence, isn't there, that if you do sort of set out all the pros and cons and risks and benefits of different treatment options, that patients on average will go for the cheaper, less invasive things. I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that we looked at, certainly in some conditions, that that's true. So I, I don't know, John, what do you think? Yeah, no, I mean, I certainly think that people, everybody should be an economist and think like an economist. Obviously, I think that, you know, it's a <laughs> world view, you know, and it, we can, you know, all, we, we theoretically solve any problem um, and have that view about, you know, if you do this thing, you can't do that other thing. You know, that's, you know, absolutely massive principle within in economics, opportunity cost. So I think people should think like that. But um, it, does re it does remind me, one of the things I have been involved in uh, in my working life is something called the British Social Attitudes Survey, which is conducted by the National Centre for Social Research at City University. 
And it is the question about are you satisfied with the NHS? You, you, it does hit the headlines when it comes out. It, actually, the one we did uh, just a few months ago showed the biggest, the lowest level of satisfaction ever since 1983. I mean, really low. I can't remember the figure. 29% satisfied, something like that. But a few, some years ago when I was at the fund, King's Fund, we had a question, we devised a question to ask that about uh, what should be available on the NHS. In, in, it's quite hard to design these questions to get, you know, get, try and get sensible answers. We had, I think, something like three options. One is anything, so just absolutely anything. Uh, one was uh, anything that was effective clinically, medically, and anything that was effective and cost effective. And so we phrased it slightly differently. We phrased it in a way. So we, those are the options. Well, the results came back about a third, a third, and a third. <laughs> so there are a third of people who just want absolutely anything available on the NHS. And about a third want it uh, if it's you know, clinically effective and no matter what the cost and, and so on. So, so there's some way to go, I think, in, in that sort of education of, of people. But just to quickly on that, on that sort of the end of life stuff and whatever, um, I was actually at, with somebody else here having that sort of conversation just before this. And I've always, it's a, it's a difficult one, but isn't, it, isn't that a converse, the conversation that you have with your clinician, as it were, and the family have with the clinician. I mean, my, I, my father died a few years ago, and that is the conversation my sister and I had with a clinician in his hospital. So my dad was unable to speak. He was 93, he was dying. It was clear he was gonna die. Question was when, really? And it wasn't gonna be five years. It was gonna be, we're talking months, weeks, days, and so that, you know, we had, my sister and I had that conversation and it was, and we couldn't tell what he felt like, but that was, that, that was the, relation, the clinical relationship we had. It's hard to see how you legislate for that in some way. Um, and it's got to be, I think that's just one of those jobs that clinicians have to, they know they have to take on, isn't it? I mean, dealing with that. Um, I can take one more question. We've got the mic, brilliant. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in the, the conversation that we've had this evening has been um, kind of largely around sort of hospital costs and, and how we might think about... Um, district nurses. Didn't district nurses, yeah. yeah. No, but bringing that back round actually to the outcomes, um, thinking about outcomes contracts, and I work with, for an organisation that develops outcomes-based services with the NHS, and we find it really quite difficult to... Um, we're obviously looking to... to design the, the outcomes that are good for both people and for the health system, it's really difficult to do that if you want to be looking at outcomes that are community-based or primary care-based. You know, it's really quite easy to do if what you're talking about is a notional economic value that is in uh, an acute hospital. And so we are often developing services that are looking at kind of proxy outcomes, so in other words, less time spent in hospital rather than, you know, better time spent in the community or, you know, so I just wondered if you had any thoughts about how we might kind of bring those two things together and bring it back round to your data collection in the community. You know, how can we kind of incentivize that really? And I know that's a really, you know, really good outcomes-based services are very empowering to staff. You know, a lot of what we've been talking about this evening is how do you get staff really engaged in what they're doing? Um, and that might be yeah. one way, but any thoughts on that? Well, just, sorry, just on that, I, as an economist, don't w use words like cost-effectiveness cost improvement program, productivity, efficiency, those, those are, you know, they're important to economists, uh, I'll admit that, but what they really mean are better quality, more people treated, that's what they're about really. And so when I've talked to clinicians, I try and avoid using words like productivity and efficiency and so on. Um, uh, sorry, just on the, on the sort of d data stuff, um, I've been involved, or I was involved in, just before I left or retired from Nuffield, in a NIHR-funded um, rapid evaluation uh, work. And one of, the, one of the things we tried to evaluate was um, something called Red Thread, which is a charity working with clinicians at UCLH in the children's uh, emergency department. And they're dedicated to um, supporting kids who turn up with stab wounds, essentially, and other trauma. And um, 
so these kids will turn up and they'll be, they'll be stabbed and they'll be treated by the NHS and traditionally, in a sense, pat patched up and sent out again crudely. Um, but, but then they'll turn up again and, and so on. So they're in the community, they're also in hospital. It's a sort of crossover. But trying to evaluate this service, what are we, what are we getting from it? And we did, in the end, resort to avoided emergency readmission, <laughs> which is sort of, yeah, OK. But in fact, really, what Red Thread wanted, and we wanted as well, but it's so difficult, is um, not engaging too much with uh, the criminal justice system, doing better at school, um, being a happier person in life generally. And there's a whole range of other outcomes. It's a bit like going back to what does a hospital produce? Well, it produces dead people and alive people. That's one crude way of measuring it. But it, it does so much more than that, as does the education system and so on. So uh, it's not impossible. It just does take quite a lot of data gathering. And that's where it starts. And that's where it started in hospital with, with patient reported outcome measures and so on. And there are ways of finding out how happy people are. Um, you, 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 I mean, economists have done this a lot in lots of different fields where you think, well, how do you know, how can you measure that? You can't measure that. And in fact, you can measure it, usually just by asking people in a, in a clever way. You know, you can devise ways of asking people. So it's, it's, it is really important and, um, and it, can be, it can be done. I mean, I, don't, I can't think really of a situation where it can't be done, but it takes money. You know, collecting information isn't costless. Uh, that money could be spent on something else. So you've really got to, uh, how do you sh demonstrate the return on information gathering is, is can be hard. Yeah. It's, it's <clears throat> my my uh, sense of utopia when I was at NICE was that we'd have much better routine data from the NHS that helped us answer our questions. And, and John sat on our safe staffing committee, do you remember? And uh, yeah, the, the data the there relied on, relied on someone who'd collected it all in a, in a little note a little notebook, but um, w will we get to that utopia with more routine automated data collection? And is AI going to answer all these questions? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I love ChatGPT, actually. I just, uh, some months ago when I really got into it, I, I had to do a talk, internal talk at Nuffield for my colleagues. I didn't have to. I wanted, I foisted it upon them, actually. Um, but what I was playing around with ChatGPT, and which for those of you who don't know, is a large language model being made open access for the public and they're gathering data, but it's also people, you ask questions and you get some very nice polite replies back, which may or may not be true, which is interesting. But I asked it to describe the Nuffield Trust just straightforwardly and it came up with a, a sort of a uh, couple hundred words. I thought, bloody hell, this is good. Oh, I must come from our website. So I went to our website and it doesn't. No. It didn't come from our website. Um, not even, you know, not a single sentence. Then I got into asking whether, could it do it in the style of uh, J.R.R. Tolkien um, or uh, Damon Runyon or a uh, West Coast surfer dude and so on. And it came back with, you know, it, was, it was very impressive in that sense. I, I just, I do wonder though whether AI could be used for based on, so you don't have to maybe do a census of all patients, i.e. everybody. Even if you had some sample data, mm -hmm. you could use AI to start as a, as a, as a modelling exercise and it could actually then use, that data could be used mm -hmm. itself. Or you could even use AI to generate, in a sense, artificial data, mm -hmm. but which is true. I, it's describing a, actually economists have a word for that, a stylized fact. We know this thing's true, but we don't quite have the data yet to prove it. You know, but it's a, we know it's sort of a true, it's stylized fact. In fact, Patricia Hewitt, who was the Labour Minister of Health, when she first got into office, apparently said to her civil servants at the Department of Health, can you bring me the model of the NHS you use? <laughs> And the uh, civil servants, I think there was quite a lot of, uh, well, we don't have one. Um, and they, they, actually commis they actually commissioned, I think, Frontier Economics. I don't know whether they actually ever produced anything in the end. But it's, you can use AI to, to, in a sense, generate a world of data. And that, so that may be a possibility. Mm. 
Well, listen, we are just about out of time. So fi final question from me, which is in the future, we've had the next election, we've got a new government. I won't speculate on what flavour, but what advice would you give that new government about funding the health service? Hmm. <laughs> I think, I think there's no doubt the NHS needs more money at the moment. Um, uh, I mean, COVID was, an, you know, an, an absolute... Um, I mean, it was just terrible for staff, for the, for the whole system, and we still, you know, we're still suffering from that. Or we, the NHS is in terms of um, uh, the impact it's had on, on a lot of NHS staff and so on. Uh, the NHS is still not back to producing you know, the sort of activity that it was before COVID. Waiting lists have been getting worse and worse for actually quite a few years. Not, it's not just COVID. Um, it's looking at seven and a half million people on an elective waiting list. I mean, that's pretty bad. Um, people are waiting a long time. So there's no easy solution to it, but I think more money is, is part of the solution. Um, but perhaps not the black line. Perhaps not the black line, but I do wonder whether there's, there should be some commitment to a bit like another Derek Wanless, actually. Let's have a, let's and try and bring in the public around that as well. That, so what is the debate about the money and what it can buy and, and what, what we're prepared to give up for that? You know, how much, I mean, education could really do with a huge bung of money. Um, and I think everybody knows that. So. Are we getting to that point where we, these trade-offs are becoming a bit more apparent, I think? I'll thank you properly in a moment, but before I forget, I must remind everyone that the next In Conversation Live is on the 14th of June with Melanie Reed, who you might, have, might be aware of. She's going to talk about the impact of catastrophic spinal damage. So if you can come to that, please join us. But Thank you so much for those no, you, fascinating Jim. stories. It, I think everyone really enjoyed it. And thanks to you all for joining in yeah. too. Thank you. Thank you.